class, right? 9.30. Well, okay, so um, whatever. Um, so first announcement is uh, about uh, makeup class. So <laughs> it's not about this makeup class, it's a makeup class about um, this course. It's, um, it's followed, uh, so we, we missed uh, one class last week. And next week on Tuesday, I'll be absent. I have some uh, personal issues to attend, so I, I, I have to travel to Europe um, for a few days. So what um, we'll do is we'll group these two makeup classes and I suggest to do it this week on Friday afternoon. Uh, around, you wanted to go to Seoul? Well, forget it. <laughs> you have to leave later. Um, three to five. I don't think, I think there's no English class. Um, and that's about the only time I'd like to do it and I don't want to um, postpone it too much. So three to five on uh, Friday. Uh, yeah, and tell, say to your friends uh, who may or may not show up. Um, then the other thing, um, right, so last, um, when we were meeting last time, I just uh, put up the wrong slide here. Um, we were discussing, we had seen a, an example of how to um, uh, calculate, how to use the um, Peach Curler formula, yes, for two parallel uh, edge, dis we've, we've done it for two parallel screw dislocations. And um, we just finished um, going through the, uh, the math for the uh, two parallel edge dislocations. Um, just, and it was towards the end of the class, so maybe um, things were not so uh, clear at that time. Um, so, so basically, what, what we do is we, we assume we have one dislocations here in the, in the origin of your um, uh, coordinate uh, axis, and, the, and you consider another dislocation parallel to it, an edge dislocation. And this edge dislocation can have um, the same Burgers vector, yes? Mm -hmm. Or um, basically they, look, they both look the same, yes? Or, or they can have a different Burgers uh, um, vector, mm -hmm. so in this case, if we, in both cases, consider, in the three cases, consider we our uh, uh, direction, line direction in the board. So you know, line direction in the board, yes, extra half plane up here. That means uh, a finish start right hand uh, convention. Burgess vector is here. This one's the same dislocation. In this case, the, uh, the um, extra half plane is pointing downwards, so the Burgess vector points to the right. Hmm? So, okay. But, okay. Um, so, right, so, so, and so this one stays here, and then we, we put this dislocations anywhere in this space, right? Okay, so uh, the core of this dislocation has an X and a an Y coordinate. That's basically what defines its position. So, um, and so, uh, so basically, uh, there are some places where the dislocation, uh, interesting places where the dislocation can be, right? And so, uh, so this is the diagonal here at 45 degrees, yes? Uh, then along, if the dislocation is this core is here, right? X is equal to Y, right? Obviously, the, so X over Y is one, uh, anywhere along this line, yes? Uh, if this location is on this side of the diagonal, x is necessarily larger than y. So 
x over y is larger than 1, yes? And in, is it above the diagonal, x over y is smaller than 1, yes? Okay? And, and if it's exactly on this line, so you have this location that's exactly here, well, here x over y is 0, okay? Okay? And so, so um, in, in this diagram, what you basically do is the position of the dislocation, yeah, you, you actually uh, use the x over y ratio, right? So this is the x over y ratio, yes? And this is the force on the dislocation. And if this, this force that you calculate is positive, you have repulsion. If it's negative, you have attraction, okay? So, um, and, and so the results uh, tells you that if you have the same sign, yes? Yes? Um, and you're in the region from one to infinity for x over y. So if you're in this region here, yes, in this region here, yes, um, you have a positive force. It's, it's kind of repulsive. Yeah? It rep the dislocation will... Uh, however, yeah, if, I get, if I get close enough to this diagonal, to x equal to y, yeah, so x over y, 1, yes? I see that the, the repulsive force gradually decreases and becomes 0. Hmm? So if, the, if this, the edge dislocations kind of uh, uh, do this, yes, uh, I have a 0 force, yes? Hmm? OK. And then, um, and then I come in a range where the dislocations attract each other, yes? They're attractive, yeah? So in this region here, yeah, this region here, yeah, there is attraction. Hmm? Okay, so the dislocation will want to move closer to each other. Hmm? Now you have to realize that uh, there may be an attractive force between these two, yes, but uh, this dislocation cannot, you know, uh, move up and down. So it will glide closer to, as close as possible to, to this guy. Hmm? So, um, right. And if they have opposite sign, it's just the reverse. Yeah? The opposite signs, yes. The red region, they will always attract. In this region, they will pull apart. Hmm? Okay. So, uh, again, and so it's, it's interesting because it explains uh, to us why it is that if you deform a material, yes, and um, you heat it up slightly, yes? So that means you give the dislocations enough uh, thermal energy, yes? They will, they will move with respect to each other, yes? And form low energy, low energy dislocation configurations, yes? They will, in other words, they will tend to move, I may go back, back in the other direction. It, oops, there we go. So they will tend to move to situations where the force between them is zero. Yeah? Okay? Or it's, it's very low. Okay? And that is the principle of uh, recovery, basically. Hmm? basically. So what, what, what does this graph tell you? Hmm? Well, for instance, it, it tells us that Okay, so if you have um, the, the same sign, yes, uh, the edge dislocations in this region here will be attractive, attracted towards this one, yes, and the edge dislocation on, in this part of the diagram, yeah, lo located in this part of space, hmm, will be repulsed. Yeah? So, so as a consequence, um, uh, like sign dislocations will have a tendency to align uh, like this. Right? Go on top of one another, yes, where the force is zero. So, okay, so that means going to this point, x, x, will, x over y equals zero. Right? Yeah? And when you have that, yes, um, edge dislocations like this, you, f you have a low angle tilt boundary, okay? 
And this would be, for instance, the result of a deformation that's followed by recovery. Yeah? And you can see the amount of dislocation hasn't diminished. But the energy has diminished. Yeah? The, 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 the strain energy has diminished. Okay? Um, in the reverse, yes, say we have different um, uh, Burgers factors, then in this part of space, the interaction will be repulsive, hmm? and in this part of space, the interaction will be attractive. Yeah? So you will tend to see uh, dislocations of burger, uh, uh, with different Burgers factors yeah? with, uh, yeah? um, form um, an equilibrium configuration that looks like this. Hmm? So they will align along the 45 degree uh, diagonal. Yes, to, again, to minimize the, and, and so what does this correspond with? This corresponds to this point here, the other uh, zero force point. Hmm? Okay, and uh, you can have this uh, side, or, or, or you can, this is also a low, uh, low uh, uh, energy configuration, an alternative one, okay? Uh, when this happens, these low, um, again, uh, a stress effect is no, no, the amount of dislocation doesn't decrease. Yeah? It's the same amount of dislocation, but um, I guess it's not, it's not recrystallization what, what we're seeing here. Okay, All right. okay. so and, um, last week I realized it, it was a little bit too fast um, with my um, explanations here. Uh, And I needed, right. I needed to go back a little bit um, because other yeah okay so so we we um, remember last week we inter we we calculated the uh, the energy of a, a dislocation line huh? and um, we. Um, uh, we, um, we noticed that, um, so you had basically these th three terms, hmm? um, a term uh, g b squared divided by 4 pi, then a term where you see this cosine alpha, yes, that is basically um, tells me that the dislocation energy is a function of whether it's an edge dislocation or a screw dislocation, some sort of mixed dislocation, and then a term that is related to the um, how you integrate, how you determine the energy, basically. Hmm? And um, although it's an interesting physical problem, this calculation, uh, it turns out that the impact of this factor is not so large. Hmm? So, and, it's, and I, I told you this, this natural logarithm there at the end is about five. And, um, and, and, you know, it's not very sensitive to, to the things uh, we will do with this term. So, and then you have L, which is the length of the dislocation. The longer dislocation is, the, the more energy it has. So, and that allowed us to determine, to tell you that, or introduce a factor which we call the line tension, is basically the energy per unit length. Yes, so, and that's, uh, if you take you know, average, uh, uh, the orientations, if you take this natural logarithm e equals to 5, etc., mm -hmm. uh, you, you calculate this 4 pi factor. Uh, th this is the energy per unit length of dislocations. Okay. All right. So, and we, you know, and I told you that this B square criterion was very important because it uh, tells you um, whether a specific dislocation will change into another dislocation or whether two dislocations will come together and form a new dislocation. And we like to talk about this as dislocation reactions. Obviously, they're not reactions like chemical reactions, right? They're like mechanical effects, all right? All right, so, so the... Uh, the best way to, to introduce this dissociation is we have to talk about FCC crystals because you'll see in a moment in um, 
in uh, BCC crystals like ferrite, you know, like everyday steels we have, uh, we don't get dissociation of dislocations, right? So I uh, necessarily have to talk about FCC iron or austenitic steels. Hmm? So in austenitic steels, if um, uh, we look at uh, the, the crystal of crystallography of an edge dislocation, hmm? so we have here a glide plane, which, is, which are 111 planes in uh, FCC. And then we have um, uh, drawn here an extra half plane uh, in, in that particular crystal structure. Hmm? And, um, and, and so this extra half plane is just a, a 110 type plane inserted here. Yeah? Okay. Right, and so if I, um, again, I take my line direction into the screen, yes, my um, uh, extra half plane is, is coming from up, yeah, so my Burgers factor is to the left, okay? It's a convention, okay? Um, now, if you do this, yes, you have to look at the crystal structure. The, the one, one O planes, they're actually stacked. It's not always the same plane. Hmm? It actually consists of a plane A type, B type, A type, B type. A, B, A, B, A, B. So the stacking of the, so when you introduce an extra half plane, yes, and you want to, you don't want to disturb the stacking sequence, you actually introduce two planes, two 110 planes, okay? Okay. Now, what can happen and what does happen in many uh, uh, austenitic steels, yes, uh, is that these two 110 planes, yes, you can see they can move away from each other, yes? They can move away from each other, yes? Hmm? As separate edge, smaller edge dislocations, yes? Smaller edge dislocations. And when doing this, you will keep the right stacking sequence, yes, of 110 planes above and below the, uh, uh, the slip plane here. Hmm? Okay, we, we're not talking about the stacking in this direction because when we do this, yes, we'll see in a moment that we create a stacking fault in the stacking of the 111 planes, okay? okay. So, um, so we have, when this happens, we have now an edge dislocation on this side, an edge dislocation, excuse me, a dislocation on this side, a dislocation on this side, yes? And in, in for this particular uh, uh, Burgers vector, hmm, A upon two onto uh, one bar, one zero, I'll show you in a moment how this works, yes? Um, these are the two partials that we get, one over six, one bar two, one, one over six, two, bar two, bar, bar one, bar one. Hmm? Um, okay, and the, the, de the defect that we create here is a stacking fault, and we call this, in, see in a moment why, intrinsic stacking fault. Hmm? So first of all, um, this is an, an application of the uh, B square criterion because this will only happen if the dislocation, the B square of the starting dislocation and the B square of the uh, reaction dislocation, if you want, this B square is larger than B1 square plus B2 square, where B1 is this one and B2 is this one, Burgers vector. Okay. So, Okay, so, so let's first do this little calculation, all right? So, um, so the B squared criteria. Um, uh, right, so, so again, this, we're not talking this situation here, crystallographic situation, does not hold for ferritic steels, for BCC. It's FCC and so necessarily for 
austenitic steels, uh, which have a, an FCC uh, structure. Hmm? So, um, so this is what we call the Burgess vector of undissociated dislocation, and this is the Burgess vector of these two new dislocations, these two new dislocations. Huh? And this is the reaction. It's not, we write it like a chemical reaction, but it's not a chemical reaction, okay? So don't think about it as a chemical reaction. A upon two, um, one zero bar one is A upon six, two bar two plus A upon six, one one bar two, okay? So I calculate the length of this dislocation, basically squared, I find A uh, square over two, and I make the sum of this, the, the length square of this vector and the length square of this vector. Right? It's, very, it's very simple. And when you have the way, um, I show you the way how to do it here. And you find A squared divided by three. So this is uh, 0 0.5 times um, A squared, and this is 0 0.3 times A squared. So this obviously is less than, th than this. And so, yes, the uh, dissociation will occur, yes, on the basis of this B squared criteria, hmm? okay? Now there, uh, and so what the uh, uh, line t uh, uh, energy tells you is that, yes, on the basis of B squared, this should happen. However, when you do this, yes, and these two um, uh, dislocations are created, in between these two dislocations, you, you create a stacking fault. You just create a stacking fault. So um, w what do we mean is that the, so the stacking fault in a, a normal FCC is ABC, 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 like this. We'll, again, I'll, I'll show you in a moment how this works out in the crystal. Um, and then um, there are actually two ways in which – so if you remember – the yeah, this is what we had the, the, the two extra half planes here. I'm going to give this number call this number one and this number two. Yes, the dissociation can go into in principle in two ways. I can have or I can have looks the same except that in this case. The discussion that was here is on this side, and two is here, and in the other case, we get this, okay? They're reversed, yes? They're reversed. Okay, so depending on the, uh, the way this dissociation occurs, yes, we will have a stacking that looks as if we have removed plane B. Hmm? Or we will have a stacking which looks like we have inserted a plane C. Hmm? And so look like A, B, C, A, C, A, B, A. So, and C, A, C, A, yes, that is the stacking you get in a hexagonal in epsilon iron, yes? Hmm? So we call this a nucleus, if you want, of HCP iron. Mm. Uh, but it can also work out differently. Mm. You can, if, if you ins the, the dissociation has happened so that the stacking fault looks like you have inserted a C plane, then you have A, B, C, A. Normally you have B, A, B, C, etc. Excuse me. S uh, a, C, B, C, A, B. Okay, so in this case, if you look here, um, along this line, you have A, then mirrored to not, uh, with respect to this A plane C, C, B, B. So you have made a twin here, hmm? a twin. Hmm? Okay, now, ha of course, you don't insert planes and so what, what happens is you shift the crystals, yeah? you, you, you make a shift. Yeah? So if you do this, yeah? Um, and you can try to do it um, uh, rather easily by just um, looking at the stacking. So you ba what you're basically looking at here is the stacking of 111 planes yeah, viewed along a 110 um, um, direction. Okay? Okay. And so 
uh, you can see you have stacking A, B, C, A, B, C. So, what, um, so you see here three planes above the, this uh, atom is repeated. Yeah? This one is repeated here, this one is repeated there. So these positions have names. Yeah? Now you can do a, um, uh, a, a shift, yeah? for instance, if we shift now this B atom, this B atom to this position here, yes? To this position. So it, it comes right over the C atom, yes? I'm just doing one shift, I'm pushing this like, okay? Then, uh, of course, this B atom is not called B anymore. Right? It's not called B because it's, it's, it's above a C atom, right? So it's called, I, I call it a C atom now, right? A, B, so A, B, C, A, C, A, B, C, yes? So I, I, I didn't insert anything, right? I didn't put in, I just shifted, you know? I shifted uh, my crystal, yeah? Mm -hmm. As if a small partial dislocation had passed, right? That's what... That's basically what, um, what happens when you have a dislocation passing, yeah? Okay. And, um, uh, and if I do another shift, yes, now I have this one, and I shift A to this position, then A comes on top of B. So the name of A it's not called A anymore, it's called B, right? because we're talking about stacking here, right? So it's a B type stacking. Uh, this B becomes C, and, and we have formed A, B, C, A, C, B, A. And you can see the twin. So the, 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 these um, different stackings are, are not uh, because we you actually add an, a layer of atoms, or it's just because of the shifts. You get different shifts, whether uh, the partials are uh, this way or that way, dissociated that way, okay? Okay, so, um, but whatever uh, you do, yes, in between, uh, in between these two uh, dislocations, you create a stacking fault, yeah, stacking fault. And um, now, what is interesting is that if you start with, say, an edge dislocation, yes, um, your two partials will not be edge dislocations, not pure edge dislocation. The, but they will have an edge component. You see, a Burgess vector, and uh, say I have a dislocation line, yes, and a Burgess vector like this, yes. Um, it's you know this angle is whatever. Yes, it's not zero, it's not pi over two. But I can always decompose it in an edge component perpendicular to the line and a screw component, yes? Okay, so, um, so when you do this dissociation, the two partials have edge components, yes? And the extra half planes, yes? So they, they, and the extra half planes are coming from the same direction, right? So if I go back to where we started uh, with this morning, I have an edge dislocation at the origin, and I have another edge dislocation here on the same plane, yes? So in what, regions, uh, in what region are we here? We're in this region, right? In the red region, yes? And that region is repulsion. So when the dislocation dissociate, they instantly push each other away because they, their edge components are repulsive. Okay? Um, and, and, uh, and, and we know from this graph that this repulsion is, you know, it's, it's always re repulsive. Yes? And so, um, uh, but there's something that limits the distance they uh, travel away from each other, and that's the stacking fault. Because as I, uh, uh, as they push to, as they push each other away, we generate uh, a stacking fault. Yes, and the energy of the stacking fault is 
positive. So that means um, that there will be a sweet spot where they stop moving away from each other when their repulsion energy yes, is, um, is, is, is uh, equal to the energy yes, um, created by the stacking fault, right? generated at the stacking fault. Okay, okay and so, so we can calculate this. Hmm? Um, right, so let's, uh, right, so here. See, see uh, so the, the force between the two dislocations, so what, what do we have? It's basically, we're going to calculate the force, yes? So we, this is one of the partial dislocations, yes? And I multiply with this. So the so so, so this is as as if you want the the uh, the shear mm, the, sh the, sh the shear component of uh, the dislocation at the origin. So this is tau times b. Yes. And this is just basically the peach curler equation for this particular case. Yeah? Okay. So so I just apply this. Yeah? And, and, and we know the distance, they're, they're at D, yeah? D away from each other. So, and, um, and, so, and basically plug in uh, the only thing I need to plug in, which are the two uh, vectors, Burgers vectors. Yeah? And I have to make a dot product, yeah? dot product here. Yeah? And, uh, and I find this, G times A square divided by 24 pi times D. Mm -hmm. So again, Shear modulus plays a role, and the distance, one over the distance. Hmm? So, um, uh, so, so, the re so the, the closer they are to each other, the larger the repulsive force, hmm? and, and the repulsive force dies uh, as one over d. Hmm? Okay, and this force is balanced by an attractive force due to the stacking fault energy. That means that uh, when, when these dislocations, this dislocation moves to the left, and this dislocation moves, okay, this is not the Burgers vector, it moves to the right, and I create more and more stacking fault, yes, okay, and I, to, uh, um, I, I, I call the, the, this, the, the energy of the stacking fault gamma. Hmm? So if this force is equal to stacking fault uh, energy, hmm? I will get this, um, I get equilibrium, so the distance at which these two partial dislocations stop is given by this. Hmm? G A squared divided by 24 pi times gamma. Hmm? So the distance is um, between the two partials is uh, proportional to one over gamma. So if I have a, if the, the energy of the stacking fault is very high, the, dis the dissociation distance will be small. If the stacking fault energy is very low, the dislocation can be very widely uh, separated. Hmm? Just let's, let's just, because the distance is proportional to one over the stacking fault energy. So if the stacking fault energy is large, I will have very small dissociation. If the stacking fault energy is low, I have a very wide dislocation, yeah? And that has very, very important implications, yes? And if the dislocation, uh, stacking fault energy is extremely high, then there's no dissociation. Where does this, you know, when, when does a, you know, like in steels, and austenitic steel, ferritic steel, when does, when do dislocations start to decide we don't dissociate? Yes. What's, well, well, we'll see. Um, but um, a, a value for the stacking fault energy where there is no more, where you can be sure there won't be any a dissociation, about 100 millijoules per square meters. Yes. Okay. So, uh, millijoules is a joules energy per meter square, right? So, so surface energy, the, the gamma is. All right. 
Okay. So, um, this, uh, well, this is an example here, right? This, for instance, the top here is a, an austenitic steel, yes? Um, you see these four white lines, yes? So, the two top ones are um, two partials, yes, belonging to uh, a dislocation, so they're they have uh, two Burgess factors are indicated, BP1, partial 1, and BP2, partial 2, yes? And there is another dislocation that's dissociated, yes? Right, so now um, the, the equation we've just seen, there is a more sophisticated version of it, which takes into account the orientation of the... Uh, undissociated dislocation, wh whether a dislocation is edge or screw or mixed, yes? Mm -hmm. But it's basically the same um, idea. Mm -hmm. So the distance between the two parts is uh, proportional to one over the stacking fault energy. Mm -hmm. So if you use this equation, yes, use this equation, for instance, um, yes, you measure this by experiments, so you get D from experiments. How do I measure this? Well, very simple. I measure the distance between these two dislocations like this, yeah? yeah? And then I plot this as a function of the angle. So in this is a TM work. I can uh, determine what the Burgess factor is, yeah? And I can uh, determine, uh, if I know what the Burgess factor is, I can see what the line direction is, right? I, I see here the line direction is, is here, and here it's in this direction, so, right? So I can determine theta, yes? And um, so if I know theta from here, yes? I can plot all the measurements I made, yes? So these are measurements, these are measurements of D values, yeah? right? And I see here, and I, I plot this here, yeah? and then I plot this this equation here for different values of uh, the stacking fault energy. Yeah? Okay? And then by fitting the data to um, uh, 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 these uh, calculations here, these lines here, uh, for that are obtained for different stacking fault energies, I, I can basically determine what the stacking fault energy is approximately. You can see the scatter can be uh, quite considerable, um, uh, but the stacking fault energy for this particular material, 18% manganese steel, is around 30 millijoules per square meters. And, and so it's, it's the dis you can assume that all the dislocations will be dissociated. Yeah? Okay. All right. The dislocation, uh, the stacking fault energy, yes, the stacking fault energy, is de is determined by two parameters, yes, and uh, the first parameter is composition, and the second parameter is temperature. Hmm? Um, the um, so this is an example here for for stainless steels. You know that um, austenitic stainless steels are very widely used in uh, many applications. Uh, uh, and uh, you know that the main alloying elements in this, uh, this type of steel are, are chrome and nickel yeah? in austenitics. And the chrome is added to give the steel a corrosion resistance, and the nickel is added to give the steel the austenitic structure, hmm? so not for corrosion, right? And the chrome is not added for to get austenite. Right? Hmm? So they have these two elements have different uh, reasons to be added. Let's put it this way. Now, um, they influence the stacking fault energy. Hmm? So, for instance, if you look at the number of steels, yes, where you don't vary the nickel content too much, right? 13 to 16 percent, so it's a relatively narrow range, yes? And you plot the stacking fault energy as a function of the chrome content, which varies 13 to 25 percent, you see that there is a decrease in the stacking fault energy. So adding chrome will result in wider stacking faults, yeah? 
you look at the effect of nickel. Again, you, you use alloys where you select them so that you have a relatively narrow uh, range of chrome contents, so, so 17 to 19 percent of chrome. Um, and then you vary, uh, you plot the stacking fault energy as a function of nickel content. Yeah? And so you see that the nickel content increasing will increase the stack. So that has an effect of reducing the stacking fault width. Mm -hmm. So stacking fault energy is strongly influenced by the um, right by the um, uh, composition. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And I also said the stacking fault energy is temperature dependent. Why is that? Mm -hmm. uh, well. First of all, um, I'll, I'll make our lives simple by, by, by first saying that people have looked at, in metals, how do, how do stacking faults, what do stacking faults look like? Yes, by looking at what dislocation is on what side of the stacking fault. And they find that the stacking fault is usually, what they say, we call intrinsic. And when we have an intrinsic stacking fault, it basically means um, it looks like we have removed uh, a B plane or it's the HCP type stacking fault that prevails in practice. Hmm? Okay. Um, so basically our, our stacking fault looks like this, like a little sliver, little sliver of austenite inside the FCC structure, right? So if that's the case, you can basically uh, use thermodynamics to calculate the stacking fault energy because you basically have to say, well, when I create uh, a stacking fault, yes, yes, I basically transform austenite into HCP, yes, yeah. and that's one thing I do. And then second, I create interfaces. I create austenite, uh, epsilon iron interfaces. Yeah? So, so this little, uh, this is the stacking fault region. Used to be uh, austenite. Yeah? So I transform it to epsilon iron, right? right. And so... That's one thing. And then the other thing is here, it used to be a gamma, gamma interface is transformed to a gamma epsilon interface. Yes, here and here. Okay. Okay. So um, with this, we can calculate the, this re reaction just using delta G. Yes change in free energy from thermodynamics, yes? And so, and I don't derive this equation here, but the, the relation is stacking fault energy is two times the uh, molar surface density times the free energy change for the reaction, in this case, gamma to or transformation, gamma to epsilon, plus a term related to the surface energies, yes? So I have a actually very simple formula, which if I know this interfacial energy value, and if I know this, yes, I can basically calculate what the stacking fault energy is, yes? Um, this term here is, is basically, cal it's, it's the molar uh, surface density of 111. Uh, this should be gamma planes, of course, yes? Um, and, and, and this is the formula, you, you just apply this and, uh, and, and you get um, this uh, parameter. So easy to, to calculate if you have the lattice parameter of your alloy, okay? So let's, let's, uh, uh, let's calculate uh, an example here. So uh, what we need is a lattice parameter, we need Avogadro's number, we need the driving force for the gamma to epsilon transformation. That's 200 joules per mole. Um, 
where does this come? Well, this, this basically comes from either thermodynamic measurements yeah, or from um, uh, programs that allow you, like uh, thermocalc, yeah, that allow you to, to get this, this data, this thermodynamic data. Hmm? So basically from the literature, if you want. Uh, then the interfacial energy. That's probably one of the, the weakest point in this theory, right? Um, it, 10 millijoules per square meters. Um, that's a low uh, interface energy. Um, uh, and, and that's what, use, what we usually use, yes? Hmm? For uh, this kind of interfaces. The shear modulus uh, is comes, it appears in the formula. And of course, the Burgess factor of the partial dislocations. That's A upon 2, 1, 1, 2. Uh, so if you apply this, you find uh, 0 point about 15 nanometers. And then Poisson's ratio. Okay, so the stacking fault energy, yeah, so this equation here, I just plug in all the, these, these uh, parameters, yes? Of course, making sure I've got the right um, uh, dimensions here, yes? And I find 32 millijoules per square meter, hmm? okay? For this, this particular set of um, uh, data. So um, if I know the stacking fault uh, energy, I can determine how much is the separation between two screw dislocations. That's basically this equation, right? Separation for s screw dislocation, theta is zero. For uh, edge dislocation, theta is pi over two, hmm? or 90 degrees. Okay, right. And so I find three nanometers for a screw dislocation and seven nanometers for a edge dislocation, about double, about double. So the distance between screw dislocation and edge dislocations is, um, is different, yes? And the, the edge dislocation are always widely, more widely separated than uh, screw dislocations for, for, this, you know, for the same original Burgers factor and for the same uh, stacking fault uh, energy. Hmm? Okay. Uh, so, um, so obviously, composition has an effect on free energy, yes? Because you can have epsilon phase and you can have gamma phase, but um, depending on what alloy you have, you have different free energies, yes? Okay? And of course, the free energy of a phase is temperature dependent, yes? Yeah. Um, so what, what we see is that uh, the effect of the temperature is that the, the stacking fault energy increases when the, temperature, when the temperature increases. So you get less, um, less uh, the, the dislocation separation is smaller at higher temperatures. Okay. Okay, so now let's, let's, um, let's talk about Alpha iron, ferritic steels. What's the problem or what's the situation there? Why, why uh, did I um, uh, not, uh, why did I choose to focus on austenitic steels when I talked about stacking fault? Well, the simple reason is because the stacking fault energy of alpha iron and of uh, ferritic steel is huge. Yes? So, um, and I, I don't know how, how high it is. We, so the only way you can actually um, guess how high it is is, is by, doing, by calculating it, yes? Hmm? Uh, because in the, with uh, austenitic steels, you can, you can just experimentally look at what at the separation and then determine the stacking fault energy. Yeah? In, in uh, BCC uh, and ferritic steels, BCC iron and ferritic, you can never see a separation, so you, you have to assume it's very high. Yeah? So, so what, what you can do is, and what people do nowadays because of the computational tools we have, they will, um, they will determine what we say the generalized stacking fault energy. 
So what they basically do, they, they take, for instance, the BCC lattice and they shear the lattice, yes? They shear the lattice, yes? And they can determine what is the increase of the energy they get, yes? yes. As you shear the lattice, yes? And, and you can, you know, computationally uh, spoken, you know, if you do DFT uh, calculations, you can do any shift you want, you know, and calculate things that will, of course, not be seen in, uh, in, in nature or experimentally. So you can do this shift, yes, and you can determine for every position, uh, every lattice mismatch, basically, what the energy is. And if you do that, um, for instance, this is for a shear on, uh, on a, a cube plane, this is for shear on a 1O one, uh, uh, one plane, and this is for a shear uh, also a 1O one, one plane, but this shear is along a 1, 1, 1 direction, and this one is along a cube edge direction. And you see, I had told you 100 millijoules per square meter. That's kind of high already. Uh, this goes up to, you know, 1,000, 500, etc. So the stacking fault energies in BCC uh, iron, yes, and in ferrets, it's huge. So you, we never see uh, dissociation in BCC iron and ferritic steels, yes? And that is a very essential property of uh, BCC iron, as we will see in a moment. Hmm? Okay. Right. Y you can do the same for uh, uh, FCC, yes? And uh, I just... Uh, want to introduce it. So you, again, you, you plot the energy that you create when you shift a crystal, um, top part of a crystal, in a 112 direction, yes? And you compute the, um, the energy as a function of the position. Yeah? And, and so when you do this, well, When you do this, so for instance, I shift this B atom here hmm, to the right, yes? So, it, so first, I see that when I create a stacking fault, yes, hmm, this B atom here uh, will, will go to a position where it's on top of a, uh, yeah, with, where it's shifted, yes? and it comes in between, yes? So in this symmetric position here, it's difficult to see, but this kind of um, equally separated from these two A atoms, yes? yes? That's a slight, this has a slightly higher energy. We call this the energy of the unstable stacking fault, yes? And then when we continue to shift B, yes? It becomes a C stacking plane, yes? C, yeah? And that has a high, slightly higher energy, and that's the intrinsic stacking fault or the stable stacking fault. And you can see that the structure here is an HCP crystal, yeah? an HCP, a sliver of HCP material in the a a FCC material. And then if I would continue to push this C atom to the right, it would now face this A atom, and I would have an AA a a condition, that's a very high ener energy situation, very high energy, and, I, I, uh, and of course I get uh, an increase in the stacking fault. And then as I continue, the energy will decrease. So that's a new concept that people are using, instead of just the stacking fault energy, which is this, mm -hmm. uh, they use the generalized stacking fault energy, which allows you to, for instance, consider this, yes? Because um, the way the dislocations will dissociate it, dissociate, excuse me, will require to go through this unstable stacking fault situation, okay? More details later, perhaps, if we get that far. All right. Okay. Right, so um, we will 
need this a little bit in, uh, in the future, but I, I just want to make sure um, I introduce you some um, concept um, uh, which is uh, very widely used yes, to uh, describe um, uh, dislocations in FCC austenitic steels and in BCC peritic steels. Yes? Uh, and um, so you know that both these crystal structures have BCC, uh, uh, cubic unit cells, but it's very, very inconvenient to use cubic unit cells to describe um, dislocations. Yes? Instead, um, we use uh, these geometrical uh, shapes here. Hmm? This is a, a tetrahedron, yes, a tetrahedron. And, and this is a rhombic uh, dodecahedron. Hmm? Dodeca means 12, um, 12 faces. Hmm? OK. Um, so first, let's do uh, perhaps uh, this uh, tetrahedron, yes? And when, when we use this tetrahedron uh, to, dis you know, to uh, work with dislocations in FCC crystals, we, t we call it the Thomson tetrahedron because that's the guy who just uh, uh, proposed the use of this uh, uh, system, and it's very useful. So basically, uh, where does this t the tetrahedron uh, fit in the uh, FCC unit cell? Well, here. So do you see the unit cell? And then I put the, uh, one of the corners of the tetrahedron in the origin, and this is what I have, OK? So you can see, um, going from here to here, what is, what is the, um, this is a vector, yes? If I go, for instance, from this atom, which I call A, to this atom, which I call B, Yes, mm -hmm. I, uh, so, so this is X, this is Y, right? and um, this is the atoms of the unit cells are here. Mm -hmm. This is the unit cell. And um, so I have, at the level higher, I have this atom here, yeah. and I have this atom here. And of course, I forgot this atom here. So the, the, the tetrahedron is seen from the z direction down, yes, is, is like this. And then this line here. Yeah. So this is atom A, this is atom B, this atom I call mm -hmm. D, yes, and this atom I call C. All right. So this vector here, what is it? Yes? Well, we know that this is um, the length, th this is A, uh, O1, O, right? And this uh, length here, hmm, to, to, to this, this here, right, uh, is A, 1, O, O, yeah? So uh, from here to here is, um, and A upon 2, 1, O, O. And from here to here is A upon 2, O, 1, O. Okay? So this vector here is the sum of this vector and this vector. So it's, it's the sum of, uh, it's the sum of A on 2, O, 1, O plus this vector. And this vector is the negative of this vector, so it's A over 2 minus 1 O O. So A over 2 minus 1 O O. So A B, the vector A B, is equal to this, the sum of these two vectors, A over 2 minus 1 1 O. Okay? Right, so I basically have a tetrahedron where all the edges yes, are Burgers vectors, undissociated Burgers vectors. Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to show, so, so this would be point, say, 
uh, A, this is B. Yeah? So if I go, as I said, from A to B, this, this vector here is A over 2, uh, 1, bar 1, 1, oh, is it, is it right? Yeah, OK. All right. Good. So now we do another thing. Okay, and this this uh, point here is called point C. Yeah. This plane here is crystallographically one one one, but we also call it the ABC plane. ABC plane. Yeah. This vector here, a upon two bar one one o. We can call it that way, but we also call it the AB vector. So with the use of the, the advantage, if you wonder why, you, why people you know, make things confusing and using AB instead of you know, using the crystallograph, well, you can, you can use whatever you want, basically. But this is shorter than, than this, right? Hmm? That's basically why people use it. It's, it's much more, it's like, it also gives you a shorthand notation of the dislocations. Hmm? Um, right, and then um, the, there are other important points. There's another important point on the, um, on the, uh, on the, uh, Thompson tetrahedron. So if I take point B here, yes, yes, and I connect it with this point here, so I basically uh, take the diagonal, yes, it will intersect my uh, triangle here in a special point, which I call point delta. Yeah? And I can do this for all the other planes. Yeah? For instance, if I B I do the same, I, I, I connect with uh, the diagonal, uh, the point, the, the atom to, uh, on the diagonal, in the diagonal direction, I find point beta. Yeah? And why is that important? So I have a point here in the middle, that's delta. Yeah. So basically, this is point D. If I let down the normal normal on this plane from point D, I, I find delta. That's basically it. Now the interesting thing is that these vectors here, yeah, are actually the vectors for the partial dislocations. Yes. Right? So I can see that, for instance, this vector. I can, can be created by the sum of A delta, delta B, right? So A, B, A delta plus delta B. Hmm? Okay. And of course, these vectors here have uh, crystallographic notations equivalent. Hmm? Hmm. So this is shown here. Yeah. So this ABC, this delta here, um, so uh, B delta, A delta, these are the, the, the corresponding normal crystallographic notations for these vectors. Hmm? A upon 6, minus 1, 2, minus 1. A upon 6, 2 minus one, minus one, okay? And then, of course, there is one in this direction also, okay? All right? So that's the Thompson tetrahedron. The Thompson tetrahedron is something for FCC metals and alloys, right? Yeah. So if you're working on ferritic steels, you don't need all of this because the slip planes and the Burgess vectors are different, right? And that's why in, so this is for gamma iron. Hmm? For alpha iron, 
and for ferritic steels, yes, the um, configurations of the um, uh, glide planes, yes, and the Burgers vectors are different, yes. It's one thing, and the second thing is, as I already said, there are no partial dislocations, yes. So there are no equivalent a delta delta b type of vectors. Yeah? Okay. So how does it work there? In a BCC crystal, the uh, glide planes are 1, 1, 0. Oh. Now, um, I don't know how much you know about uh, uh, the, the deformation in BCC crystals, but you know, maybe you've, you've, you've had some classes about this in the past, and, and then people say, well, you know, yes, it's 110, but it's also 112, and it can be 123, uh, et cetera. So at this stage, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll talk about this in more detail. But for, for all practical purposes, in steels, again, in steels, 110, you should consider 110 as the glide planes, okay? Uh, but again, we'll go back into uh, all the details as, as we. <coughs> continue. So, um, so what do we do in this case? Well, we do the same thing as we did for the Thomson tetrahedron, because what the Thomson tetrahedron did is basically just cut out a shape which is bound by the slip planes, all the possible slip planes in the crystal structure. So what we do is we do the same thing now for BCC, and we cut out the slip planes. Yes? And we find a, something similar where the, the surfaces are slip planes, yes? The faces are slip planes, and the, the edges are Burgers vectors, yes? So here, this is the shape, it's a little bit more complex. Um, and uh, so, so we have uh, the Burgers vectors and here 110 type planes, okay? So, um, but you'll t you can see, okay, um, right, so can do you see, do you see the square, do you see the square, yeah? Right, so, so, so you, you're looking down a, um, a, one of the cube directions, like an x direction, right? Mm, okay, and so if, if I, um, uh, I don't Myself, yeah. So, and there, you know, there's another cube direction, etc. So, you just have the symmetry of the crystal, also. Huh? Um, okay. So, and do you see the hexagon? You see the hexagon? Yeah. Okay. So, in what direction is the cube? The cube hexagonal. Does a cube have a hexagonal symmetry? That's in one, one, one directions, right? So. Um, in, and so you can see here, when, when you see the, the hexagonal shape, these edges also are parallel in the same direction. So, and these are one, 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 indeed, one, one, one directions. And um, so what uh, it basically means is that our slip planes are 100 planes and our slip directions or Burgers vectors are a upon two, again, in, in also in this case, um, a upon two, one, one, one directions, okay? Right, so if I have, so now, um, let me do a drawing of this, right? So one of the, uh, right? So for instance, myself, It's actually not uh, right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here, um, um, this is 
Yes. It's one of the, could be a 110 plane, yes. And let's say, yes, uh, we have a, a dislocation with this Burgess vector. Yeah? So um, if I have a loop here, yeah, a dislocation loop, for instance, like this, yes, this part here will be a screw dislocation. Here is also a screw dislocation. And this part here will be edge type. Hmm? This is the Burgess vector. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that's what, what we have in the case of the uh, uh, BCC iron. Hmm? No dissociation. Okay. And we'll see that um, I'm going to stop here because uh, um, that, um, th that will lead to very different behaviors, okay? In, uh, uh, from mechanical uh, point of view. I think yeah, we'll stop here, right? Yeah, let's, let's stop here. I'll, I'll talk about this on, um, on Thursday. So you don't have to worry about this um, for the quiz. Um, good. Um, for the guys who came in late, Friday we have makeup. Friday, yeah, three to five. Yes. Yes. And um, yeah, three to five. Yeah, and uh, and Thursday morning quiz as usual.